All right, if you have a copy of God's Word, I want to invite you to open to the book of 2 Corinthians this morning. We're going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and we're going to look at verses 16 through 21. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verses 16 through 21. So here we are. Uh, we are standing on the, the cusp of a, a new year. And so we are, are celebrating that in some ways this morning. And of course, we always know that the Lord's grace, the Lord's mercy is new for us each morning. But this time of year usually brings with it reflections on the year that we, we've had, the one that has just gone by. And if we were to look across the entire scope of our year, as far as the church family, we would see uh, stories of, of great joy, great, uh, great success and rejoicing, but we would also see stories of, of pain and sorrow. But through all of it, I think we could uh, make the case, of course, that the Lord has been completely faithful to us. That whether we were uh, having times of epic failures, even personally in our spiritual lives, or we were having times of great success personally in our spiritual lives, the Lord was faithful all through the previous year. And maybe last year, some of you made some New Year's resolutions. And of course, maybe this is not the time to bring it up, but I wonder how many of you actually kept those New Year's resolutions. You know, we start off pretty good as the year goes on. We'll uh, make a resolution to eat less sugar, or perhaps it's to read our Bible more often. And sometimes, sometimes we do for a while, and sometimes we reach Leviticus and the whole thing falls apart. And it's not wrong for us to focus on things like that. It's not wrong for us to set goals or to think about things that we would like to uh, have for us or be able to accomplish in the year that is to come. But sometimes I think that we get so focused on what we want to do that we forget what God has done for us and what God is doing in and through us because of Christ. And so sometimes we get so focused on our performance that we forget our identity. We get so focused on what we can do that we forget who we are in Christ. And this is dangerous. It's dangerous because of the fact that the only reason that we are able to do anything to be transformed into the likeness of Christ or to do anything spiritually is because of, because of who we are. So that us being conformed into the image of Christ is not separate from who we are in Christ. It is because of who we are in Christ. And if you are a Christian here this morning, then you are a new creation. You belong to the realm of new creation. You no longer belong to the old creation of, of death or where death and sin reign. You belong to the realm of new creation where Christ reigns. And where one day we will spend all of eternity in a new creation. But He's already made you a new creation. This is something that God has done in you because of the work of Christ. And you now live in union with Christ. You are a new creation in Him. You live in this, this new realm that will be consummated at the return of Christ. But it's only by truly understanding who we are that we are able to safeguard our heart from sinking too low when we fail. Or from thinking too highly of ourselves when we succeed. You see, because on our worst day, we are still new creations in Christ. We still belong to Him. We are still ambassadors for the kingdom, and we are still reconciled to God on our best day. Because of His grace, we are new creations in Christ. We are ambassadors for the kingdom of God, and we are reconciled with our Creator. And that's what I want us to focus on this morning. And the reason is because I believe that the chief way for us to think differently, to act differently, to worship differently in the year to come is to understand who we are. In short, I want us to frame our mind correctly as we start this new year and to think about ourselves according to what God would have to say about us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So let's read 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verses 16 through 21. I'm going to back up to verse 14 and read 14 through 21, but our passage is 16 through 21. God's word begins and says, For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this. That one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, behold, the new has come. All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to Himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. 
That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Let's pray this morning and ask God's blessing and His assistance on His Word as we study it. Our Father in Heaven, Lord, we come to You this morning with our Bibles open to 2 Corinthians 5. And Lord, we pray that through the work of Your Holy Spirit that You would open our hearts and open our minds so that we can understand this passage. And Lord, as we are standing right at the brink of the new year, Lord, we pray that You would frame our thinking, that You would help us to see our identity in Christ, and that through this this reframing through this understanding of our identity that you would transform us by the renewing of our minds. Lord, I pray for those who don't know you, that today for them would be the day of salvation, that they would see that there is only reconciliation possible through Christ, no other way. And Lord, I pray that they would understand that they are sinners in need of grace. Father, this morning we are clay in your hands and we pray that you will mold us and make us, that you would use us, that you would shape us into anything that you see fit. Father, we love and thank you, and it's in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So the first thing that Paul tells us here is that in Christ we are new creations. And that's in verses 16 through 17, but Paul is building off of what he says in verses 14 and 15, namely that our new life in Christ makes a difference in the way that we live and we think. He says, when Christ died, all those who trust in Him died in Him. So that those who live in Him live for Him. And we can see that as we see in verses 14 and 15. He says, for the love of Christ controls us. This means that it, it influences the way that we live our lives. He says, because we have concluded this. He says that one has died for all, therefore all have died. Now, he doesn't mean that died and live in the sense that every person, whether they put their faith and trust in Christ or not, died with Christ. That's not true. What's true is, is that all those who believe in Christ, they have died with Christ and now they live in Christ. He's using this idea of all here to describe those who are believers in Jesus. And he died for all that those who might live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. So those who died in Christ, who live in Christ, they don't live for themselves anymore, but now they live for Christ. But notice that once he gets to verse 16, he starts thinking about the way that this shapes or frames the way that we think. We no longer think the way the fleshly people do. And that's what he says in verse 16. From now on, therefore, right? Therefore, because of this, we regard no one according to the flesh. Then he's going to talk about how we once regarded Christ according to the flesh. And we'll mention that here in just a moment. But why would Paul make mention of this? We well, have to know something about what's going on in the book of 2 Corinthians, and that is, is that Paul is dealing with some of these super apostles, right? And this is very sarcastic from the pen of Paul. But there were these people that came in, and they were basically saying that they were superior to Paul in every way. They were greater speakers, they had these great ideas, right? They were coming in and they were influencing the church, but the influence they were putting on the church was not leading them closer to Christ, it was leading them away from Christ. In fact, many believe that they were teaching a Christ that did not accord with who Christ truly is. And we don't know exactly what they were teaching. But the fact is, is that outwardly they were impressive. They were impressive. If you looked at them, if you thought about the way that they spoke, they spoke with eloquence, they were impressive. But Paul says inside they were spiritually dead. And all through 2 Corinthians, he points to this reality but here he's showing them that if they were to think about things from a spiritual perspective rather than a physical one, then they would understand who the true apostle is. And this carries into what he's saying here. His point is, is that they, that he rather, and they should not, no longer, they should no longer judge by worldly standards. Paul says we don't look upon the outside or what the world would consider to be superior or right. That's the way we used to think. But now that we died in Christ, now that we live in Christ, we don't, we don't think about people that way anymore. That's why he says we regard no one according to the flesh. But he says from now on, from the point of our conversion, from the point we receive that new heart, when we receive that new, that new life in Christ, we don't think the way the world does 
anymore. But it's natural for the world to think about worldly success and power and to elevate that. But the fact is, for us, it's not natural, at least not anymore. Naturally, those of us who have died to the flesh with Christ, we don't view people the way that fleshly people do. Think about this. Maybe this will help you to understand it. What do you see when you look around you? We're gathered in a, a church here in Sperger, Texas, right? We are sitting here in this place. We are studying a Bible that is, you know, 2,000 years old at the newest point. What do, you, what do you see? Well, of course, we see citizens of the kingdom of God. We see brothers and sisters in Christ. We see this book to be a book that is inspired by God, breathed out by God. We are, we are people of the kingdom. We are people of the book. We belong to Christ, all of us. We understand that we are eternally important, not just because we were created in the image of God, but also because we have been redeemed at an eternally pricely cost, the cost of Jesus' own blood. But how do you think the unregenerate view us? How do you think the world views us? How do you think the world views what we're doing here this morning? Do you think they see anything of great significance here? You see, what the Bible tells us is that what's happening here this morning... The worship of God, the preaching of God's word, the giving of our offerings, that these things are, are eternally important. What is happening here this morning, what is happening across all of the churches in the world on the Sunday morning gathering is more important than anything that happens in the White House. It's more important than anything that happens in Hollywood. It's more important than any athletic performance on a field of grass. But do you think the world sees it that way? Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians that not many of us were wise, that God has chosen the foolish things to shame the wise. The world views this sort of thing as foolishness. But why do we see it differently? Why do we see kingdom citizens? Why do we see each one of us as brothers and sisters in Christ when the world would see foolishness? The reason is because we're a new creation. You see, our dying to Christ, it made us view people differently. It made us view things differently. We don't view things the way the world does anymore. When we see someone, we see them as someone created in the image of God with an eternal soul. If they are in Christ, we see someone that is a, a co-laborer in Christ, someone that is a co-citizen of the kingdom of God. But when we see people that don't know Jesus, we see them as, as slaves to unrighteousness, slaves to sin. People that need the grace of Christ, need the grace of God in Christ. But why do we see things differently? Because we're new creations. And Paul immediately starts talking about Jesus in verse, verse 16 right after that. He says, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Paul says he used to view Christ from a purely human perspective. He could see him only as a man. In fact, Paul thought he was a heretic. Paul thought he was a blasphemer. He thought he was someone that was lying about God. So much so that he added his support emphatically when Stephen was being stoned to death for sharing the great gospel message to those around him. Paul was traveling to Damascus with letters of intent to put, up, put out the way. Right? To put people into prison who believed like you and I believe. He hated Christians because he hated Christ. He viewed him purely as a human. But he says, I don't view Christ any, way that, any longer that way. But how could he possibly? How could Paul possibly continue to view Christ only as a, a mere man, as he was converted on the road to Damascus so, so dramatically? As the Lord appeared to him in blinding light, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Calling him to salvation. How could he possibly? How do you, how do you view Christ? How, how do you view Christ? Surely those of us who have been made new creations, those of us who have been born again, we see Him as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. The eternal Son of God. God the Son incarnate. We see Him as the second member of the Trinity who took upon Himself flesh to live the life we could never live and die the death we all deserve. We see Him as God. We see Him as the creator and sustainer of all that is and all that ever will be. But how does the... How does the world view Christ? 
Some people view him very negatively. They view him as nothing more than just something to mock. If you turn on the television, if you listen to people that don't know Christ, the way that they use their words, they will use his name. They will add his name as an exclamation to their, to their speech. They make up lies about him. They think about things that aren't true about him. They believe everything but the truth about him. I remember whenever Da Vinci Code came out, Dan Brown's writings, and all of these, these Gospels started becoming prominent, these Gospels that are, are false Gospels about Christ. Then was he married, or did he have children? All, all, of, these, all of these questions, and the, the case for the historical Jesus, or the, the search for the historical Jesus, and the Jesus seminars, and all, all of the garbage that the unregenerate view about him. But not one of them view him as the king. Not one of them view him according to God's word. Even cults and counterfeit gospels and false religions, they, they have something they have to deal with Christ, and so they view him in different ways. Maybe he's a, a prophet, or maybe he's a, a model of love and acceptance, or maybe he's the first created being, or, or all of these different things. And they, they sometimes will view him as a man who simply died in his prime, right? As in a, he's an example of someone that was a victim of human hostility. They, they killed a religious zealot who maybe thought too much of himself. They view him in all of these different ways. But why do you see him differently? Why did Paul see him differently? The different evidence? No, no. Why? Well, it's because he's a, he's a new creation. And we are new creations. So Paul says in verse 17, he says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. He says we are new creations. This is the same thing that he, he meant by saying he, he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. He means that we have been born again. We're no longer dead in our trespasses and sins. But think about, why do we need to be made new creations? Why isn't it enough for us just to simply clean our life up? Why can't we just sort of wash ourselves or just put away certain sins and then be acceptable to God? Why is that not right? Why can't we do enough good works to save ourselves? It's because of original sin. You see, in Adam we fell. We were condemned in the Garden of Eden as a race. The human race was declared guilty in Adam. But because of that fall, we all inherited a sin nature. So we all sin. I don't know if you knew that. Have you ever, I mean, think about this. We're Christians. We have the Holy Spirit living in us. Have you ever tried to go an entire day without sin? I hope you have. But let me ask you this. Were you successful? If you drove anywhere near Houston, I doubt it. <laughs> Maybe that's just me. I probably speak too much of my own struggles. But the fact is, none of us, even in a regenerate state, can live completely sinless. Maybe our motives weren't right. Maybe we did the right thing, but for the wrong reason. Or maybe we did it for the right reason, but not 100% of the right reason. You see, it's impossible for us. But we were already declared guilty. And because of our sin, we are separated from God. In our natural state, we hate God. We may want things that God can provide. Right, which is largely what the prosperity gospel is about. It's unregenerate people seeking things that God can provide, things that He never promised to provide, at least not in this life. But Paul says that in our natural state, we're at enmity with God. We don't seek God. We don't want God. We can only see things from an earthly perspective. We belong to the realm where sin and death reign. That's, that's why we need to be new creations. That's why no other mode of salvation can possibly save us. It's impossible. We could never be good enough. We can't even be good enough for an entire day. But what does it mean to be made a new creation? Because Paul says that we are new creations. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, notice, notice that is the qualifier. You have to be in Christ. In Christ, well then he's a new creation. This tells us that it is only by faith in Christ that we become a new creation. Or as Jesus himself says, he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father except through him. But what does it mean to be made a new creation? It means that we have been given life. We were spiritually dead. And God caused us to be born again. 
to become alive toward Him. Jesus talking to Nicodemus in John 3, one of the most religious men on the planet. Jesus looks at Nicodemus and tells him, Unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Paul would see this being born again as being made a new creation. It's this new state that we live in. We have a new heart that, that loves God. Do you know how odd that is to the world? Do you know how miraculous that is? You see, we as Christians, we get so used to swimming in that water where we love God that we forget how foreign that is to an earthly, per earthly perspective or an earthly mind. Think about it. One day, one day, maybe you were sitting in a pew. And maybe, maybe you didn't give much thought to God. Surely your heart, you didn't love God. But one day it's like a switch flip. And now you love God. Now you love Christ. You love God's people. There was this change that happened. You didn't love God. You didn't love God's people. Maybe you didn't even think about God or God's people. But, but suddenly, at some point in your life, all of a sudden, you were... You were in love with God, in love with Christ. You loved Him, yet you had not even seen Him. You, you love Christ. What happened? You became a new creation. And you have this, not just this new heart that loves God, but now you have a new mind that thinks about God all the time. Once, you probably never thought of God. Many non-believers, if you ask them, they'll say things like, Well, I never, I've really never given it much thought. Or maybe they only think about it when they're at a funeral or when someone confronts them with it. But in their, their normal nine to five, they, they don't give any thought to God. But you do. He's the center of your thinking. Everything that you do, everything that you think, is, it revolves around God. I mean, we're in a church on a, a Sunday morning on New Year's Eve. Why are we here? Because our world revolves around God. Not only do you have a new mind, but you have new desires. This new love for God, this new mind that thinks about God, comes with it with new desires to obey God. This is a stumbling block for non-believers. They, they read God's Word, they read the Bible, and they, and they see God's law as a binding thing that enslaves them. And they'll say things like, well, I don't want anybody being king of my life. Or I don't want anybody telling me what to do. I'm a man. I live my own life. I'm the king of my own castle. And they can't get past it. Well, the fact is, a non-regenerate person, they can't get past it. They're always going to view God's laws and God's commands as enslaving. But what about for you? You see, if you've been a Christian very long, what you find is, is that God's commands are the pathway to true freedom. It's when you break God's commands that you see what true slavery is about. God gives us commands for our own good. Think about it. He's the one who created us and designed us. If I were a watchmaker, and I gave you a watch, and that watch had to be wound a certain way at a certain time so that it would operate properly. Well, you could say, well, I, I would really like for my watch to operate properly. That's the way that my watch is going to function properly. So I will do what the watchmaker says. I will wind it at the proper time in the proper way. Or you can say, his rules are slavery to me. And you could go outside with a ball peen and you could try to wind your watch one strike at a time. How long do you think that watch is going to last? Let me ask you this. With all the freedom that our culture says it has, what do you see? Do you see true freedom or do you see a bunch of people enslaved to sin? God's commands for the believer, that's the pathway to true freedom. It's the pathway to being who we were created to be. Why do we view things differently? Because we're new. We have new life, we have a new heart that loves God, a new mind that thinks about God, and we have new desires to obey God. But then he says, the old is gone. The old is gone. Behold, the, the old has passed away, behold, the new has come. And surely he means that there is this, this shift that has happened. You move from the realm of old creation to new creation. But along with that means that your old man is gone. Christian, listen to this. When you came to faith in Christ, you were united to him. Your old man ceased to be. He ceased to be. Who you were is no longer here. Now surely your flesh still wars against the Spirit. We live in the period of the already and the not yet. 
What we will be, we have not seen, but when we see him, we will be like him because we will see him as he is, John says in 1 John. But listen, all your sins of your past have been atoned for. It breaks my heart when I talk to Christians and they bring up things that they did before they came to know Christ. Well, I still have so much guilt for what I did when I was 20. That man's gone. He's gone. Whatever that was, whatever you did, whatever thoughts you had, whatever people thought about you back then, all of that is gone. Your sin has been atoned for. Whatever it is that you identified yourself with back then, this is who I am, and now you're ashamed of that. Listen, that man's gone. He died with Christ. You're a new creation. Your new identity is in Christ. Whoever you used to be makes no difference at all. It's who you are now. That's what matters. You see, the old has passed away. And beloved, your sins, not just of the past, were atoned for, but present and future as well, as we'll see in a moment. But here's the truth. If you are in Christ, you are a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Amen. You're not who you used to be. You are fundamentally different from the world around you. You view things differently. You think differently. You desire differently. You don't even see people the same way anymore. You are totally different because the love of Christ controls you because you died with Christ and now you live with Him but not for yourself. You live for His glory. But that's your joy because you are spiritually alive. You live in the realm of new creation. Christian, one of the great lies of hell is that you are basically the same, just polished. You are just a polished version of who you used to be. Satan loves to convince Christians that they are exactly who they used to be, just a little bit cleaner. And why is that? Why would he do that? Here's the reason. Your old self was enslaved to sin. So if Satan can convince you that you are still a slave to sin, you will see no way to be obedient to the Lord. You will constantly think, that's just who I am. Maybe that's who you used to be. But that's not who you are anymore. Now surely Christians will struggle with sin until we die. And there will be certain sins that we will struggle with until we die. But listen, listen you are not a polished version of your old self. You are a new creation. The old man is in a tomb. The new man is walking around today. Someone ever comes to you and says, I can't believe you're a Christian with everything that you, that you did in your past. You need to tell them, yeah, but by the grace of God, I'm not who I used to be. You are new. The second thing is, is that in Christ, we were reconciled to God. In Christ, we have been reconciled to God. He shifts here and he, he moves from us being a new creation. He tells us, of course, the source. We'll see in just a moment. But he says, all this is from God, who through Christ did pay attention to reconcile. Reconciled us to himself, gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. Did you notice how many times Paul used the word reconciled in that sentence or in those sentences? Five times from verses 18 to 20, Paul says reconciliation or reconciled. This is the key idea, idea of these verses. But what does it mean to be reconciled? What does that even mean? Those are terms we, we throw around all of the time. We talk about, well, we are now reconciled to God. But what does reconciliation mean? What does it mean to be reconciled? It means to restore right relationship. I love the way BDAG explains it, one of the, the lexicons. It says the, the exchange of hostility for a friendly relationship. That's what reconciliation means. It means that now there is a restored relationship, which means that our relationship with God was, was broken. It was because of our sin. You see, we were not in right relationship with God, but God did something about it. We were in enmity with God. We were sinful and separated from God, but God did something about it. Look at the source. All this is from God. We read through verses like that and we just sort of pass over them on the way to the next thing. But think about this. God in His grace reconciled us to Himself. Can you even fathom that? 
God in His grace took the initiative and reconciled us to Him. Amen. Think about this. God had not sinned against us in any way. God had never wronged us. We sinned against God. We deserve nothing but His wrath, nothing but condemnation. God told Adam and Eve in the garden, if you eat from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will die. Amen. So they ate. And they died. He did nothing wrong. They sinned. In your life, God has never wronged you. Never. You sin. You still sin. And we deserve nothing but His wrath. Nothing but condemnation. The wages of sin is death. That's what the Bible tells us. And yet we continue to sin. So what's the payment? What are the wages? It's death. But God willingly chose to bring reconciliation to us. He chose in His grace to bring reconciliation to us. Think about it. He could have just not done it. And He would have been totally justified, completely righteous in every way. Just not redeemed anybody. Just let all of humanity populate hell. But He didn't do that. He chose to reconcile us willingly. He did it. All this is from God. But how did He do it? He did it by sending His Son. He says, who through Christ reconciled us to Himself. Again, it is the exclusivity of Christ. There is no other way. It's not about adding works. It's not about doing enough good things. It's not about cleaning up your life enough to be acceptable to God. It's from God. Reconciliation comes from God. How did He do it? Through Christ. Through Christ He reconciled us. God did this through Christ. He is the person that made reconciliation possible. God the Father is the planner of redemption. It was the plan of God to redeem humanity, but God the Son is the one who secured redemption. He's the one who paid our sin debt. If you wanted to carry it one step further, the Holy Spirit is the one who applies redemption to our heart. God the Father planned it, the Son secured it, and the Holy Spirit applies it. But the Son is the agent of redemption. He came to redeem us. And you may say, okay, well I've heard that, but how does an infinitely holy God reconcile infinitely sinful people. How can that be possible? So he sent his son. Okay, well, how does that work? What happened? Well, look what he says here. He says, that is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. That's how. That's how we were reconciled, by God, not counting our trespasses against us. Now, we'll talk about how in just a moment, but can you imagine that? I mean, be honest. Don't, don't raise your hand, and this is not testimony time. But think about all of your sin. Think about your, your evil thoughts and motives and attitudes. Think about the way that you've wronged others. Think about the evil things that you've thought about God. Think about the ways that you have failed as a man or a woman, a husband or a father or a grandfather or a grandmother. Think about all of the wrong you've ever done, the small sins, the greatest of sins, the things that you are ashamed of, the things that people don't know about, the things people do know about. Think about all of those sins. Now I want you to imagine that all of it is gone in an instant. Gone. Totally gone. So, so that if you were to walk into the courtroom of heaven and you were to open the book to your page and you were, you were to look and you were to see Cole Clark, you were to look down, the, there's no sin listed here. If you are in Christ, that's true for you. There, there's no sin there. So you were to come in and you were to assume the judge was going to punish you in some way. And you were to walk in and the judge was to open the book and to look and say, but there's nothing to punish you for. There's no sin there. The greatest of sin you ever committed is gone. It's like it doesn't exist. But not just your sins of the past, but all of your sin. All of your sin. Your sin of the past, your sin of the present, your sin of the future, the things that you will do. You see, Paul says that if anyone has placed their faith in Christ, then God reconciled the world to himself. He did not count their trespasses against them. In the world, there means any sinner. It's the realm, the sphere of humanity. Not just Jews, not just Greeks, but anybody, anywhere. People from Spurger, people from Fred and Buna, 
All of us. Amen. He's not counting our sin against us if we're in Christ. Now, I'll be careful here. This doesn't mean that just because Christ died that everyone's sin is automatically forgiven and God does not count their sin regardless of whether or not they are trusting in Christ or not. Notice that it is if anyone is in Christ in verse 17. But notice in verse 20, Paul tells the Corinthians, he says, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He commands them to. But still you may say, how can a holy God simply not count our sin against us? How could that be possible? Verse 21. For our sake He made Him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. You see, He did this by allowing Christ to be our substitute. Here, here's the truth. And I wish everyone understood this. God cannot simply overlook our sin. He can't do it. He's holy and He's just. And, and to simply overlook sin would make God unjust. Something that God could never do because God is just and holy. It would go against His, his character. And, and all the world outside of Christ, if they're honest, they're, they're hoping that God's going to grade on a curve. That God's not going not to punish them for their sin. They know they have sin. I have not talked to very many people in their right mind. That truly believe that they're not sinners. But what do most people say? If you ask them, are you going to go to heaven? What do they say? I hope so. Why do you hope? I, well, what would you base that hope on? I hope I've done enough. If, if you wanted to really know what they're thinking, it's I hope I haven't been so bad that God would send me to hell. But here's the truth. God doesn't grade on a curve and God doesn't simply overlook sin. You say, well, that doesn't sound very nice. It's not about being nice. <clears throat> It's about justice. Think about this. Imagine that you had someone that was clearly guilty. They were a murderer and you walked into a courtroom with them. And maybe it was a member of your family that, that they had murdered. And you were standing at the front and, and the conviction was coming down and the judge stood up and said, that person's not guilty. And the lawyer said, yeah, but he did do it. Everybody saw him do it. Yeah, but I just don't care that he did it. Would you say that judge was just? Surely not. You see, God can't overlook sin the same way a judge can't simply overlook the conviction of a murderer. So how did God deal with sin? Well, He made Him who knew no sin to be sin so that in Him we would become the righteousness of God. This is what we call the double imputation. And all that means is there is a crediting that happens both ways. The first imputation, the first credit, is God placing on Christ the sins of all His people. God places on Christ the sins of all His people. That's what Paul means by, for our sake He made Him to be sin who knew no sin. Now, Christ is not sinful. He knew no sin. He didn't become a sinner. God laid upon Him the sins of us all. That's what Brother Dustin read this morning. All of the sins of those who had placed their faith and trust in Christ were laid upon the Son, then God fully punished His Son in our place. Fully punished His Son. The fullest measure of God's wrath was poured out upon His Son. This is what secured our forgiveness. There is no longer any sin debt for us to pay. This is what Paul means. We studied it whenever we were in Romans chapter 3. Let me turn there. I love the way that Paul puts it here. He says this, he talks about the righteousness of God through faith in Christ, but he says this about God. He says that in his divine forbearance, this was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that, now listen, so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. You see, no one can accuse God of not being just. Because God didn't simply overlook our sin, it's just that our sin debt has been paid in full. So you take the same analogy. The person is declared guilty, but then someone steps up and says, but I will take his punishment in his place. The punishment is still put out. The punishment is still deserved. The, stuff, the punishment is still paid. That's what God did in Christ. You see, God laid upon him all of our sins, and then God punished our sins on Christ. 
All our sins, past, present, and future, are paid for by Christ in the fullest measure. This is why we are eternally secure. This is why we can't lose salvation once we have it. Once we are a new creation, we can't become an old creation because Christ has fully and finally paid our sin debt. He paid it all. There is no new sin that we can commit that can be added that Christ did not pay for. That's why Paul says there is no condemnation for those who are found in Christ Jesus. You see, your sin debt will be paid either by you forever in hell or by Christ. God is just. He cannot overlook sin. So He punished sin. But He punished sin by sending His Son to take our place. So God the judge took the punishment upon Himself. God the Son, the second member of the Trinity. That's the first imputation. Our sin to Him, which is paid for. The second imputation is God giving us Christ's perfect righteousness. He says, so that, this is the outcome of God making him who knew no sin to be sin. So that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. You see, this is the second crediting. So in your account is no longer your sin debt. That was placed in Christ's account. But in your account is Christ's perfect righteousness. Christ's perfect righteousness in place of our sinful life that we lived. The sinful life that Christ died for. So listen, Christian, not only are we forgiven, we are declared perfectly righteous based on the righteousness of Christ that is now on our own account. This is what Paul talks about in Philippians, that he may not be found in a righteousness of his own, in a righteousness of his own that comes from the law, but rather in a righteousness that comes by faith through Christ, the righteousness of God, the righteousness of Christ. This is what you get in place of your sin. You get righteousness, you see? This is, again, why we are eternally secure. Not only because there is no sin debt for us to pay, but because we are totally righteous in the courtroom of God. Listen, God's favor toward us is not based on our performance for Him. It's based on the perfect righteousness of Christ. So if you were to walk into the, the courtroom of God, and you were to open the book, and you were to look under your name, there's Cole Clark. We talked about how all of my sin would be gone. But in place of that sin, do you know what you would see? Perfectly holy. Absolute righteousness. And you may say, well, Cole, I know you. That's, that's not true. Well, you just keep your opinions to yourself. <laughs> While it's not true according to the way that I live, it is true according to the decree of God. Because just as Adam's guilt was imputed to me, so now Christ's righteousness has been given to me. So listen, in the courtroom of God, you are absolutely righteous if you are in Christ. You are a new creation. You are reconciled to God. This is why God can look on you with favor, even though you're a sinner. And listen, that doesn't change, by the way. Our union with Christ can never be severed. So on your worst day, listen, on your worst day, when you look in the mirror at the end of the day, you're brushing your teeth and you're looking at yourself in the mirror and you say, I cannot believe how foolish I behave today. On your worst day, completely forgiven, perfectly righteous in the courtroom of heaven. On your best day, the best day you've ever had, completely forgiven, Perfectly righteous in the courtroom of God. Not because of anything you did, but because of what He did. You see, all this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to Himself. This is how an infinitely holy God can have a relationship with sinful humanity. Now surely there's a sense in which we will become progressively more and more righteous as we are conformed into the image of Christ. But that's not what Paul's talking about here. He's talking about being declared righteous in the courtroom of God. So while our sin can hurt our co union or our fellowship with God, it can hurt our relationship that we have, the way that we experience God, and the way that we experience our relationship with God, our union with Christ can never be broken. So if you are saved today, you are saved for eternity. If you are a child of God today, then you are a child of God for eternity. So to sum this up, God in Christ reconciled us to Himself. 
by punishing His Son in our place. So that our sin would not be counted against us. And then God in Christ gave us Christ's perfect righteousness. So that we are reconciled to God. Completely forgiven. Counted completely righteous. Listen. As holy as Christ is holy. In the courtroom of God. And in this way there is no longer a barrier between us and an infinitely holy God. We are in perfect relationship with Him. Which leads to our last point. We're going to look at this really quickly. In Christ, we are ambassadors for the kingdom. In verse 18, he says, All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Then he says here, Entrusted to us the message of reconciliation in verse 19. Verse 20, he says, We are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. Surely there is a sense in which this applies to Paul in a way that it is not to us. Paul is an apostle. There are false apostles who have infiltrated the church in Corinth. And in that sense, Paul is writing to say that he is a spokesman for God in a way that we are not. He is an apostle. He is speaking and writing the very words of God in this letter. And there are no longer apostles like that. But we share the same message. The same message of reconciliation that Paul delivered. We are still ambassadors for Christ. God uses the reconciled to, bring, to preach reconciliation to the world around them. Peter says this in 1 Peter 2.9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. These are the, the words that Moses said or that God said through Moses in the Old Testament. Here Peter now applies it to us. But here's the outcome. That. This is true of you. That. So that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. We as the church, we have been entrusted with the message of reconciliation. We are ambassadors for Christ. An ambassador is a spokesperson. Here this word is, is really related to being an elder type person, an older person that would be a good representative. But, but here it carries with it the idea of being a representative. He is the one who represents the one they belong to. He brings the message of the person that sent Him. And we are the ones who bring the message of reconciliation to the world. Notice how Paul describes it here. God makes His appeal through us. Verse 20. Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ. God making His appeal through us. Christian, always remember that when you are sharing the gospel, you are only the mouthpiece. You are just delivering the message. It's God the Holy Spirit who works in concert with the gospel proclamation to bring regeneration and new life. You are not responsible for the outcome. You are not responsible for the outcome. You are only responsible to bring the message. The results belong to the Lord. Now surely a person must repent and believe, but it is the Holy Spirit who provides the grace necessary for this, for this to happen. One pastor put it crudely, we are not the chef, and we are not the one who eats the food. We are just the waiter. We go to the kitchen, we get what the chef has prepared, we bring it to the table. And we set it down. That's who we are. We're just ambassadors. We just bring the message. But I wonder if you ever thought of yourself in that way. That you are an ambassador for Christ. You are His representative. You are a kingdom citizen. Sent into your present situation to bring the message of reconciliation to a world that is in enmity with God. So wherever God has placed you. If you, if you are at work or you are at home. You are with believers or are non-believers. You are, you are with family or are friends. You are out in the woods or you are on the lake. Wherever you go. Listen, you are an ambassador for Christ. You are a kingdom citizen. God has placed you in your sphere of influence. With your personality. With, with your strengths and weaknesses. He has placed you in the center of that place. To be an ambassador for Him. A representative for Christ. To bring the message of reconciliation to a world in enmity with God. That's you. And you say, well, man, that's big stuff. I'm not up for that. God makes His appeal through us. All you have to do is be faithful. He'll take care of the outcome. If you share the gospel a billion times and no one responds, you have still been faithful. You share the gospel and a billion people respond. You 
you've still only been faithful. The results are not up to you. So as we stand here on the cusp of a, a brand new year, 2024 is quickly coming tomorrow. <laughs> How should we frame our thinking? How should we frame our thinking? How should we think about ourselves to begin the new year on the right foot? We should see ourselves as new creations in Christ. Different than who we used to be. We are new creations. We are citizens of the kingdom of God. We were dead, now we're alive. We should see ourselves as in right relationship with God. Christian, if you don't hear anything else, if you are a Christian, I want you to hear that. You are in right relationship with God. His favor toward you is not based on your performance. On your worst day, you are reconciled. On your best day, you are reconciled. Thirdly, you should see yourself as an ambassador for Christ. Wherever you are, wherever God has placed you, He has put you there in His providence so that you can represent Him and represent the kingdom to which you belong. You are a new creation. You are in right relationship with God. And you are an ambassador for Christ. But let me, let me start at the beginning here. Not at the beginning. We're not going back an hour. <laughs> but let me bring you back to the beginning. And let me ask you this. Are you a new creation in Christ? Have you been reconciled to God through Christ? If you have not, maybe you, maybe you have been trying and failing. And you try and you fail. And you try and you fail. You know something's not right. You, you feel guilt. You, you know something's not right. You know you're a sinner. You know God is not pleased with you. And, and you try and you try and you try and you try and you try. And at the end of the day, you fail over and over and over and over again. And you're on this hamster wheel. Thinking, if I can be good enough tomorrow, maybe God will be pleased with me. Listen, that is the wrong path entirely. It doesn't matter how quickly you run on the wrong path, you'll never reach the right destination. Come to Christ. Your sin will be paid for, and in place of your sin, you will receive His righteousness. And you will be perfectly reconciled with God. And guess what? With that reconciliation comes being made a new creation with new desires, a new mind, a new heart, a new ability to live a life of obedience. So if you have not been reconciled with God, if you are not a new creation, then the first step for you is to call out for salvation. If you are, if you are reconciled with God, if you are a new creation in Christ, if you are a Christian, then listen, you are an ambassador for the kingdom. Maybe you need to write that on a sticky note and put it on your mirror. I belong to the kingdom of God. God is bringing the message of reconciliation through you, wherever He has placed you. I don't know where you are this morning, but I hope that through the study of God's Word, you will understand some things about who you are. And that by understanding who you are, then you can start off this year on the right foot. Listen, Christian, we are new creation, we are reconciled to God, and we are ambassadors for the kingdom ambassadors for the kingdom. And what a great joy and privilege it is to be a Christian. Amen. If you don't know Jesus, then you need desperately to repent and believe. Because here's the truth. You can try as hard as you can for your entire life and die and burn in hell for all eternity. That's the truth. God doesn't grade on a curve. And someone's going to pay for your sin. It's either going to be you for all eternity in hell, or it's going to be Christ upon the cross. The decision's up to you. The debt has been paid, and now it's being offered out. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, come to faith in Him. Agree with God that your sins are wrong, and ask Him to forgive you based on what Christ did on the cross. And the Bible says He'll forgive you. He'll make you a new creation. He will reconcile you to Himself. That means you'll be in right relationship with Him, and He's going to turn you around. And he's going to send you right out into the world Amen. to be an ambassador for the kingdom that you belong to. I don't, I don't know where you are, but I hope, I pray that you are a Christian. As a church, we need to view ourselves as ambassadors for the kingdom of God. I'm going to give us a time, I'm going to pray to the Lord, and then I'm going to give you a time to respond. However that is this morning for you, if you need to lay some sins down at the cross and 
you need to say, hey, I, I'm going to be moving past those. I'm not who I used to be. Then I want you to do that this morning. Maybe you haven't thought of yourself as an ambassador for Christ. And so you want to pray, Lord, make me a, a, a mighty witness for you. But maybe you don't know Jesus and you, you want to talk some more about what it means to be a Christian. I, I hope you'll come and talk to me. But wherever you are this morning, I want us all to respond. Let's go before the Lord and let's pray to Him. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we are in awe of your grace and your mercy toward us. Father, we know that you, in your grace, without anything good in us, you brought reconciliation to us through Christ. And Father, you did that by punishing your Son in our place, so that you would be just, completely just, punishing every single sin of every Christian. And yet you could be the justifier. You could take those who are truly sinners and call them righteous. Call them forgiven. Call them sons. Because of what your son did on the cross. And so, Father, we praise you for that great gift of reconciliation. And, Lord, we praise you that we are new creations with a, a new heart, with new desires, a new mind, new loves. Father, this morning I pray for those who don't know you. Lord, I pray that you would convict them of their sin and convince them of their need of a Savior. And that they would look and that they would see Christ as the only possible way to be saved. Father, thank you for this time that we've had. I pray that you will write your eternal truths deeply on our hearts. Father, we love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.